Hey everyone, it's Flag on HG, and I do a ton of hardcore Nuzlocks here on YouTube, and today we're gonna react to one of my older Nuzlocks. I believe this is my 10th Nuzlocke ever, and it is Pokemon Diamond Hardcore Nuzlocke with fire types only. So this is one of probably the hardest monotype Nuzlocks that you could do because in Pokemon Diamond, rather infamously, there are only two fire type Pokemon in the entire game. So let's just jump right into it. I got a lot of good feedback from the very first one of these that I did where I reacted to my very first monotype Nuzlocke, which was Emerald with grass types. Um, it was really nice to like reflect on my content and see how it's changed over the years. So we'll do a couple of these now and again. Let me know if you like them. If you hate them, let me know that too, and I'll never do them again. All right, let's hop into it. So you can see already that this layout is definitely much cleaner than it was in my first couple videos, right? Like there's a better use of space. There's not as much text on the screen. This is kind of what I end up standardizing and I just make little tiny improvements over time from this, but let's get started with the video. Quick note here, we also are going to be listening to the video at 1.25 times speed, just so that makes the video go a little faster and you can kind of better tell the difference between old Flygon and current Flygon. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Flygon HG, and this is the video of my attempt at a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Diamond using only Fire-type Pokemon. To see what I define as hardcore Nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the Gym Leader's Ace, and we're playing on set mode. So it's finally here. The much requested, incredibly difficult meme run of a Sinnoh Fire-type only run. Yeah, so I do distinctly remember when I was thinking about this run, like, I got so many comments on my first couple Monotype Nuzlocke videos of please do fire type only in Diamond or Pearl because they thought it was such a meme. But I looked into it, um, kind of like, oh, that would be a really fun way to, like, kind of get into the streaming side of it because I think this is a challenge that people really want to see. And uh, I realized that it does, you know, it's obviously really hard. You only get two Pokemon, so you can't mess up at all. But it's not as difficult as it might seem for a couple of reasons that you'll see. One of them being that Infernape is a phenomenal Pokemon. Fire fighting does really well into Sinnoh. So I kind of was like, wow, this might actually be doable. Let's give it a go. And obviously, as you can see, I made a video out of it. So it's at least potentially doable, though. Um, if you've seen this video, you kind of know what's what's coming, but I won't spoil it for those who don't know. Now, for those of you who have never played a Sinnoh game before, let's break down why this monologue is so ridiculously difficult. While fire types are pretty rare in most games, the Sinnoh Pokedex takes this to the extreme, resulting in a grand total of just six fire type Pokemon before the Elite Four. That means that, wait, this, this is the set of encounters for Platinum, and we're doing this challenge on Diamond. So we lose a few encounters, let me just get rid of those, and here we are. <laughs> yeah, the fire type encounters in Pokemon Diamond are this monkey and this skinny cow. That's it. Two yeah, so I really like this. Obviously, I think I would nowadays, I, I think my editing is a little faster and I have gotten better at using sound effects and music to kind of like play into the jokes. I think the joke here is really good that, you know, wow, there's only six fire types. No, nope, wait, there's actually two because Diamond and Pearl is a poorly constructed national dex. So I really like the joke construction here. I think you could really play into it by like changing the music, doing a hard cut with the music, maybe like a record scratch or whatever, you know, just those kind of things that sort of like tell the audience how to feel. I think that's one of the things that I've learned most recently with my videos is that music and sound effects are a really, really good way to play into the drama. I think especially for both sad moments and funny moments, the music is super, super important. And the timing of that music is super, super, super important. I just said super three times, so you know how important it is. Two encounters for the entire game. Fortunately, both Infernape and Rapidash are fast Pokemon, but I'm gonna level with you. This challenge was incredibly difficult. For I the sake remember of time, that. I won't be touching on every single thing that I had to consider when dealing with this challenge, chief among them being experience management so that I didn't overlevel. Mm -hmm. But if you are interested, seek out the full videos of the entire playthrough on Twitch, where I meticulously break down every issue that comes up. I'll this was before the VODs channel, so those videos are lost to time. R.I.P. Anyways, um, yeah, don't go looking for them. Also, we now have a Discord channel. Find the link in the description wow, to join Discord the Discord channel. You can don't do that Zombie, either. Make recommendations Successful. for future challenges and more. Anyways, I plug my Twitch. I plug my Discord. Is there anything else that I want to plug here? Oh! Right, this video's sponsor. 
we got this a sponsor. Is by Surfshark VPN. Okay, we're gonna skip this. Surfshark I don't care VPN about the sponsor. I, I, I see Netflix. how many that of you skip my sponsors. Like I see I see the There's dip plenty of other reasons to use the viewer it's incredibly ship. easy to use and So I'm gonna do it too, okay? Although I do remember this one being pretty fun. Flygon 8 for sponsoring the reroll encounters until I get Yeah. No free ads. I'm not gonna give Surfshark more sweet, sweet revenue unless they give me something in return, you know? Okay. A unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique I remember so I used to say this every I won't single be time. Using five Okay, let's see how it goes. I like that. As you may have guessed, I start the challenge by picking Chimchar as my starter. I named Chimchar okay. Monkey, and our journey begins. Love we Monkey. Can't get Love the name Monkey. We get to return a city. So our next stop is the first gym leader. But first, we're challenged by our rival, Rival. Our rival can be kind of difficult since he chose a Piplup, but in this first fight, the Piplup never uses Bubble, so it's pretty easy. After taking out the Starly, we just trade off scratches and pounds until we're victorious. Just kidding, we lose because Piplup gets a critical hit pound. That was fun. <laughs> okay, so we I didn't remember that. RIP attempt, attempt two, one. That's good. Go better. Starly goes down to two. Yeah, members, I mean, there's no reason I shouldn't be at a higher level here. Like, I don't know why I'm only at level nine. At the end. With that, we can move on to Rourke. Now, Rourke can be very difficult to deal with. Fortunately, the level cap for Rourke is 14, and for whatever reason, Monkey can evolve into Monferno at level 14. So this gives him access to Mach Punch, which gives him a fighting type stab move to hit Rourke's rock types with. However, there's actually an even easier play here. In Diamond and Pearl, you can get the TM for Hidden Power from the Trainer School in Jubilife, which is mm -hmm. a special move with a random type and random power based on your Pokémon's IVs, or their individual values. We'll talk about IVs more later, but for now, just know that it means that Monkey has a Hidden Power Water type with around 50 base power. And since... That is super lucky. Um, one of the things that really pisses me off is that in Platinum, you can't get Hidden Power before the first gym. I don't know why they changed that. I don't know why they were like, oh, we should cut this out of the best version of these games. But it makes so many monotype challenges and just challenges in general much, 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 much harder or much more RNG dependent. And it's super, super frustrating because like there would be so many like very fun monotype challenges that you could do in platinum that are essentially impossible because you can't get past the first chip. Now, obviously you can, you know, hack in a starter or, or, or do something to fix that. And most people don't care because it's like the very beginning of the video. But I find that really frustrating that there's like so many challenges that you can't do simply because you don't have hidden power, which would be a great answer into just quickly dealing with those rock types. Rourke is actually one of the hardest first gym leaders in the game because he has three Pokemon and the Kranidos hits crazy hard. So like you can't really brute force your way through it either. Like you can for say Brock or Roxanne even because those Geodudes just don't hit that hard and the Nose Pass doesn't hit that hard. Um, th those are some of the things that I try to think about with monotype challenges, like when I do them. I don't like doing monotype challenges just for the sake of doing them. I like to make sure that they are doable in the sense that they require strategy, not just like desperately trying over and over and over again to do it, because I find that pretty boring. This kind of toes the line, this fire types only challenge. Like in a way, it's kind of just desperately doing it over and over again. But there is a lot of strategy that goes into it as well as you'll hopefully see. <laughs> Okay, Poppy was barking, so I had to rewind a couple seconds here. Hopefully that doesn't happen again. Okay. We'll talk about IVs more later, but for now, just know that it means that Monkey has a hidden power water type with around 50 base power. And since Rourke's Pokemon are very weak to special moves, and since both Geodude and Onyx are times four weak to water, Monkey is able to sweep through Rourke's Great. entire team without much Super of a easy. Barely an inconvenience. Before heading to the second gym, we need to face Commander Mars Fire from Team on. Galactic. Definitely not Team Plasma. I know the difference. There's a that's a reference to, I think, my platinum water type challenge where I accidentally called Team Galactic Team Plasma and like I got thousands of comments of people being like, oh, it's actually Team Plasma. Like, yes, thank you. I just made a mistake. It wasn't on purpose to bait comments. I don't do that. If I make a mistake, it's almost always because either I think it's a funny mistake or it was completely on accident. Okay. A bunch of commander fights throughout this game, and I'm only going to touch on the ones that are notably difficult going forward. Despite Mars' hideously disfigured cat, this one isn't rude. one of the ones that's particularly that difficult, very rude. since Mach Punch makes relatively quick work of it. And after that, we get to Eterna City, so we can now catch our second and final team member, a Ponyta from Route 211. I name her Cow, and with our ultra-powerful tag team, we can take care of Gardenia no problem. And by tag team, I mean flame wheels from Monkey sweep through Gardenia's entire team. Yeah, monkey. The Go, Monkey! After the battle, Gardenia gives Good us job, the cow. team for Grass Knot, which will be incredibly valuable later on. 
before continuing with the gym. I think a lot of people really think that Monkey did great here, but honestly, without Cow, this wouldn't be possible because Cow soaked up a lot of experience that Monkey would have overleveled with. So just keep that in mind that Cow, Cow did a good job campaign though, we need to fight Commander Jupiter. She has a Skun tank, and that's a little scary, but we'll be fine. Cow knocks out the Zubat with two stomps, and then the Skun tank comes out, and I use a Tail Whip to lower its defense. I also use a Growl to lower the Skun tank's attack before switching into Monkey and taking it out. Just kidding, Skun tank gets a critical hit Night Slash, bypassing the stat drops, <laughs> and killing Cow. Monkey- Yeah, yeah, so that's a crit. I think that's kind of unfortunate with this challenge is that you more or less just have to hope that you don't get crit in a bunch of different places because there's so few Pokemon that like there's really no way around that, especially this early in the game where I don't have setup or anything like that. Either get crit or you don't. Also, Monkey has a nice amount of HP, doesn't he? I'm a child. Let's continue. He is able to come in and take care of the Skun Tank, but it's way too early in the run to lose Cow, so I think it's time for a reset. Yep. Somewhere around this point is when I start debating whether it's actually worth it to keep using Species Claws. If I was playing without the Species Claws, I could catch five different Ponyta, which would give me some wiggle room and some sacrificial lambs. Or sacrificial cows, I guess. It'd be kind of embarrassing if I messed up farm animals like that. Anyways, at least for now, I decide to keep trying with Species Claws active, but maybe we'll reassess this if this becomes impossible. Att yeah, so I think this is a, a good point here to make that, uh, well, two points I want to make. First is that if you lose a Pokemon early on, like early into the challenge, I would say before the second or third gym, depending on the, the game, it does sometimes make sense to just reset instead of trying to like brute force your way through the rest of the challenge. It ends up saving you time in the long run to restart now instead of try and like do a bunch of desperate plays and try and like put something together. So I end up doing that a lot in a lot of my specifically monotype playthroughs where you have such a limited number of encounters. It's almost like a, a reverse, no, I guess it just is a parabola in terms of difficulty. Like the very beginning of the game is usually really hard. The very end of the game is usually really hard. But once you can get to the middle of the game, it things actually get a lot better. So most of the wipes happen either at the very beginning of the game or at the very end of the game in most playthroughs. This one's a little different because you only get two encounters for the entire thing. The other thing that I wanted to mention here, I completely forgot about, so I'm going to think about it for a second, and we're going to cut straight to me remembering. Right, point number two that I definitely didn't take too long to remember what it was, is that I think, um, you know, kind of rethinking about your rules to make sure that the game stays fun for you is perfectly normal and perfectly fine, especially if you're not recording it for YouTube. I think one of the most important things is to be honest with yourself. And, and if you are recording it for YouTube and giving the information to a bunch of people is to present the truth and be honest about it. But whatever that truth is, is totally up to you. Like if you want to use species clause, if you don't want to use species clause, if you want to make it so that you can catch multiple fire types in the same route, I always like to tell the audience exactly what I'm doing. And I like to be honest with myself, but I also make sure to do the rules that I think I'll have the most fun with and that will make ultimately the best video. But this is just a PSA to like not be a dick about people giving themselves lax or unlaxed rules, you know, when it comes to nuzlocking. Like just do what you want and make sure you're having fun, right? Temp 3 starts off pretty much the same way. My hidden power type is fighting this time around, so Rourke is a pretty easy Lucky sweep. again. We catch a new cow. This time he's male. He's got and a shuck of berry. burning Gardenia's place of work down to the ground, it's Jupiter round 2. This time, I decide to lead with Monkey. I thought a Flame Wheel would one-shot the Zubat, but it doesn't. I get lucky though, and Zubat gets burned, meaning that the wing attack that she uses doesn't do much damage. Okay. The Skun Tank is up next, and despite some accuracy drops from Smokescreen, we get lucky and none of Monkey's Flame Wheels miss. I switch to Cow at the very end, and a Stomp takes out the Skun Tank, winning us the battle. Nice! Now that okay. that's over, we're facing an incredibly difficult Attempt part Attempt 3's the run, baby! In Diamond and Pearl, the 3rd and 4th Gym Leaders are Maylene, Invasion yeah, City, is, and I remember Crash Awake in Pastoria City, respectively. Both Maylene and Crash Awake have level caps of 30 which means that I need to beat both of these gym leaders without going over the level cap. This means that for one of these gyms, I'll need to be under level. Now, fortunately, you can access both Veilstone City and Pastoria City at any time and in any order. This means that I can go to both gyms and clear through all the mandatory trainers along the way so that I can essentially take on Maylene and Crash Awake back to back. And this is pretty necessary because Maylene has a Machoke and a Lucario that we will definitely need to one shot. Mm -hmm. And Crash Awake has all water types, including a Gyarados. So this is going to take a great deal of preparation but we have a few resources at our disposal. The first is that I get access to the underground. Mm, this is important okay. for a few reasons. So this is one, it gives me access to a bunch of- This is gonna be a little tedious, but I think this is a great example of giving the audience all the information about like the run that you're doing so that like, 
they can make the decision about whether they like what you're doing or not. Here, I'm explaining that I'm going to hack in a bunch of items that are technically farmable. I don't do that for every single playthrough, but for these really, really hard ones like this one, I do do it so that it makes the challenge more feasible and the challenge doesn't fail because I'm impatient, which I think is like pretty narratively unsatisfying. But um, we'll, we'll see how I explain this. I think you, I could, my guess is that I could probably explain it in a more concise way, but that's what you learn when you do, you know, a hundred of these or so. Cool items, like a heat rock, which will extend the length of sun from sunny day, which is a TM that I pick up and teach to cow. The underground also gives me access to virtually unlimited money. By mining for items and with enough patience, I'm able to sell items. I don't mean to keep pausing like a ton, but I do like here that compared to the Emerald video, even this is a lot more dynamic. I think in the Emerald video, I might just have like regular playthrough footage of it here. Like I'm actually making the effort to, you know, get an interesting PNG, have the PNG moving up and down. I would definitely do more of this. I would use some anime clips nowadays to kind of like make this more interesting. I would pop up info about the specific heat rock that I'm talking about, things like this. But I do like that I can kind of see the progression of me getting more familiar with keeping the audience entertained throughout instead of just assuming that they're listening to it and not watching the screen at all, which I know a lot of you do. And that's totally fine if you like to watch them that way. But I do like to put a lot of effort into trying to make the video as entertaining as possible throughout the entire thing instead of like just making it an audio podcast, right? I find in the underground for money without having to challenge trainers over and over again. This means that unlimited money is not tied to experience points. It just requires a lot of patience. With unlimited money, I'm also able to purchase unlimited coins at the Veilstone Game Corner, where I can pick up incredibly useful TMs like Sword Stance and Flamethrower. I'm also able to purchase TMs like Solar Beam and Natural Gift from the Veilstone Department Store, as well as stat boosting items like Proteins and Irons. We get a All lot of, of I love champ. Veilstone for this reason, that you just get so many resources in Veilstone, like the number of TMs, the items, even technically you can get, you know, a bunch of EV items so that you don't have to worry about over leveling. I, I really like how many options specifically Diamond, Pearl and Platinum give you once you make it to Veilstone, which is quite early in the game, especially in Diamond and Pearl where it's the third gym and you don't even have to fight Fantina. It's against Maylene and Crasher Wake. But there's one more important resource to tap. In Sinnoh, there are two people who give you berries once a day. First is the Berry Master on Route 208, who will randomly yep, give you one of the berries number we get it. 1 to 30. We get it. This includes the common berries like the Citrus Berry, Cherry Berry, Orin Berry. It also includes the stat-lowering <laughs> berries like the Palm Egg Berry, and then a handful of random other berries like the Wepper Berry that is primarily used to make poffins. Very, Second, very descriptive. City um, I'm being very detailed super here. Effective resist berries. So Honestly, it's a little too detailed. I think I would cut this down nowadays, but um, I, I really do like how thorough I'm being. This almost reads which I think a lot of the early videos that I did do as well, this almost reads as like a how-to guide, which is a little bit different than how I usually do them now because I kind of assume that it's almost like the meta of monotype Nuzlocke has evolved at this point. And back then it was like, you know, I was basically the only one doing them until uh, a month or two later. So like at this time it was still very new and it was sort of like just at the start of kind of everybody and their mother doing these types of monotype challenges. So I think it was really important for me to make it much clearer to anybody who like, this might be their first monotype Nuzlocke video. You know, I, I think if I had a criticism of my content now, it would be that I sometimes do forget that there are new people jumping on ship all the time. And so I think something that I will probably take away from this video and, and the Emerald video that we reviewed, you know, a month ago, is that I should be thinking about explaining things that are now super obvious to me and the viewers who have been here for a long time, but not super clear to the people who this might be their very first video from my channel. So obviously we don't want to have to explain this every single time, but there's probably ways to kind of like, you know, split the difference a bit. So that's something I'll think about for sure. For example, a Pasho Berry will reduce the damage of a super effective water type attack by half. So by changing the date on my computer, I, I mean my Nintendo DS, I can theoretically get an unlimited supply of these berries as long as I have enough patience to do so. But I don't have patience. That's why I'm on YouTube. In the interest of making videos Boom. at a relatively Self consistent rate and not having my Twitch streams just be hours of this. <laughs> I just yeah, okay. to take matters so, see, into my own hands that would and speed be, up the process through the use of PK. That would be another good place to use a music cue to like make a very obvious joke here and change the music to something very boring or like the Wii channel music or something there and just like really hammer in that point. But um these are really cool. Um, a lot of these folks have like are still watching the channel. Um, 
Natu and Tom at JE, they've both been mods for the channel for a while um, until their lives got busy, but I, I really loved their early support and Rotten Honey has made a bunch of really, really cool art from all of my videos. Um, they created the Quagsire in the top hat that's in my Scarlet and Violet thumbnail. I love all their work, artwork. You should, you should check them out. But uh, I really like, it humbles me so much when people do artwork of the challenges that I'm working on. Um, like, I, I, I just love it so much. It makes me so happy that like when people reach out and feel like a part of the community, like it, it really, it's, it's so cool. So it was really cool to get to include some of these artworks here. This was like one of my very first streamed challenges. And I don't know, it was, it, I have very fond memories of it. Hey, Hex. But as a reminder, I'm only doing this to get items that are legally capable of being fought. Yeah, we get it, Flag on, it's anyways. fine. The only thing that this is doing is cutting away hours and hours mm -hmm. of grinding to make for more entertaining content. My conscience is clear, so hopefully you can live with this too. If not... <laughs> I, I was also definitely, in the beginning, much more um, kind of like preemptively defensive of people making criticisms. I think there's other videos where I like explain why I feel fine using Toxic Stall. Nowadays, I kind of just am like, okay... I'm going to do what I do. And if people don't like it, they don't like it. Um, you need thick skin to be a content creator and something like this. I think like, like we get it. Like just, you know, I think, I think most viewers are pretty understanding. So I'm like preaching to the choir in a sense here. This is already a 42 minute video. I don't need to spend this much time defending myself. Right. Anyways, not uh, let me know in the comments, you know, YouTube algorithms and such. Anyways, let's get back to the actual hey, comment game on today, this. Shall we? Um, After clearing through all the trainers, we take on Melee. Let me know First up is what your favorite I lead monkey, who type of apple stance, is. Metatite uses a drain punch. Unfortunately, I need another sword stance here to guarantee a kill on the macho in the back, so I have to risk a crit. But I'm unpunished as Metatite just goes for a meditate. A flame wheel kills the meditite, and then Lucario comes out. But thanks to its seal typing, a flame wheel is enough for a one shot as we just outspeed it thanks to some speed EVs. Last is macho, but monkey is holding a Koba bear. I talked a little bit about this in the emerald um, grass type review that we did, where I now really like to make the footage as fluid as possible. And honestly, I, I was really, really critical of the emerald grass type footage. But even here, 10 videos in, like this footage is actually very, very, for the most part, like I think it, it looks very good. It's not as choppy. There's not as many like seizure inducing flashes and, and stuff like that. I'm, I'm, I'm actually really quite impressed with how this video has aged. So props to you past Flygon, you get my seal of approval. I saw a lot of comments on the previous Emerald Grass video that said like I was really harsh on myself. And I just want to clarify that like, that's that's the point of doing this is that I'm gonna be really harsh on myself. I don't think there's a point in doing it and just being like, oh yeah, well, it's got a million views, so it had to be good. Like I'm trying to be reflective and hopefully use that to like teach myself some things and hopefully teach you the audience some things. If I were to ever review somebody else's video or Nuzlocke, I would not be half as harsh like i understand how difficult it is to make a video and like putting anything on the internet just that alone making a thing like finishing a thing is laudable right like so i'm not gonna shit on somebody else's video but i sure as heck i'm gonna shit on my own right which has damage from a super effective flying move but more importantly it means that we can use natural gift Natural Gift is a physical move that changes type and base power based on the berry that the user is holding. I don't tend to watch too many other like hardcore Nuzlocke videos, so I don't know how often other people use Natural Gift, but I use Natural Gift so often and it is such an amazing move for Gen 4 monotype Nuzlocke, like especially in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Just just great move, great move. Obviously, it's very situational, but um I remember it being huge for this challenge and several other challenges, so don't sleep on Natural Gift. With a Copa Berry, this gives us a one-time 60 base power flying type move that is able to knock out the Machoke in one shot. That's Maylene defeated. I mean, Aerial Ace would do that too, that, but... We make our way to Pastoria City and take on Crasher Wake. Crasher Wake is an absolute beast, thanks to his Gyarados, which will lower my attack at the start of the battle with Intimidate. So even a Natural Gift Electric type move won't kill the Gyarados with minus one attack. There's also the Float Cell in the back that we need to outspeed and take out quickly, so we'll need to be pretty creative, and unfortunately, we will need to dodge a crit or two. I lead Cow into the Gyarados to eat the Intimidate. I then use Natural Gift, which is based off of a Weber Berry, which gives Cow a 70 base power electric type attack. This does decent damage into Gyarados as it goes for a bite. As a note here, it makes zero sense for Gyarados to go for bite. Yeah. Brian does more damage. So does Dragon Rage. The AI in Diamond and Pearl is really dumb, which is great because it means that the AI usually doesn't go for the optimal play. 
But the thing about dumb AI is that it's also unpredictable, which means that it's incredibly difficult to predict what it's going to do, making it impossible to plan around every single possibility. More on that later, though. On the yeah, so that's very true. Um, random AI or like dumb AI really, really sucks when you're making plans for battles. Something I didn't know at the time and something that I actually didn't know until very, very recently is that in Diamond and Pearl specifically, all the AI is completely random. Like every single trainer just uses completely random moves. So that's why I went for Bite. It was it just picked a random move and it did that. So like there's going to be stuff in this video where I'm trying to like play around and maybe I'll, I'll expect a move to come from the enemy that just doesn't happen and I'm kind of dumbfounded by it. It's because it's completely random, which kind of makes this challenge a little moot. Like it's just like you're kind of just blindly stabbing through the dark and hoping that the AI doesn't pick the move that they should pick. You know, it, it may, in, in retrospect, this isn't quite the, the feat that I thought it was at the time, but I do still really like the plays that I came up with, especially with this Gyarados play. Like, I'm really, really happy with how this all turned out, but that's something to know that Diamond and Pearl, not Platinum, but Diamond and Pearl, completely random AI. Next turn, I switch to Monkey, and unfortunately, Gyarados goes for a Super Potion here, which wasn't part of the plan, but it should be okay. I go for a sword stance as Gyarados goes for a Dragon Rage. I've made sure to EV Monkey so that he won't go down to two Dragon Rages, which always does 40 damage. Nice, I hit a grass smart. Knot for a chunk of damage as Gyarados goes for a Brine. This leaves Monkey with three HP. So obviously I was at a risk to a crit here, but there was nothing that I could really do about that. Right. But now that I'm at low health, Blaze is active, and thanks to the plus two attack from Swords Dance, Flame Wheel takes out the Gyarados. We got a crit too. Next up is Quagsire, but the Chunky Boy goes down to a single Grass Knot. And then third is Float Cell, but we have another Weber Berry prepared for that, so a natural gift takes it out in one shot, winning us the fourth gym. Not match. too bad. With that massive Not too bad. Way, we get a little <laughs> bit of a break in terms of difficulty. I do know what's First happening off, to attempt three, three though. And, and, um... So Monkey is able to evolve into Infernape, which, by the way, is a really dumb name. Infernape is clearly not an ape. It's a monkey. It has a tail. Anyways, after that, it's not good take on Fantina, but compared to Crash or Wake, she should be a total Solid breeze. joke. Her Drift Loom poses a slight problem because it likes to use Minimize, and its ability Aftermath does a sizable chunk of damage if I kill it with a move that makes contact. But Monkey should have enough power to be able to take care of it without too much trouble. So I start with a Swords Dance as Drift Loom goes for a Minimize. I then go for a second Swords Dance as Drift Loom just uses Astonish, another example of the DP AI being absolute garbage. Yep. Next, totally I go Flame Wheel, which misses, and then Drift Loom hits an Ominous Wind and the 10% Omni Boost activates, giving it plus one to all of its stats. That's, that's, that's really bad. Yeah, that is Not really bad. Not the end bad. of the run, but now I do need to play. I honestly don't know if there's a way around this. Um, you know, we have Aerial Ace potentially on Infernape. I don't know if I want to waste the Aerial Ace TM here, but I really don't think there's a way around this other than just hoping that that doesn't happen. Um, I do remember this Drifling being a massive pain in the ass. So it's unfortunate, but I don't think that I did anything wrong here. It's just the challenge. Carefully and get lucky. So the first thing I have to do is hit a flame wheel. So I go for a flame wheel. Okay, okay, now it's over. Drift Blim hits a gust, bringing Monkey into blaze range. But thanks to the Omni boost, a flamethrower, even in blaze, won't kill. And if I kill with flame wheel, Drift Blim's aftermath will kill me in return. Mm -hmm. My one play is to get a critical hit with flamethrower. I managed to hit the flamethrower, but it doesn't crit. So Monkey goes down. Cow is able to come out yep. and take out the Drift Limb, but even if he can somehow beat the rest of Fantina's team, which he doesn't, this run is dead without Monkey. That was terrible, terrible luck. I had a zoom lens to up my accuracy, but even then I managed to miss two attacks and the Drift Limb got that plus one Omni boost. Really unideal, but I know I can play that fight better. So let's take it from the top. In attempt four, Monkey... So obviously losing there was really, really frustrating in the moment. And I think um, one of the things that can be really defeating about Nuzlocke is like when you wipe super late in the game like this and not having the motivation to try again. And I think that that's perfectly valid and perfectly reasonable. I think one of the best things to do is to focus on another challenge before coming back to this same one. The best thing is to not just immediately jump into it. It's to do something else until you feel the urge to want to get back and get your own personal revenge instead of feeling like an obligation to finish it. I think it's a little different as a content creator where sometimes you need to get a video out in a certain amount of time. So sometimes you do have to jump right back into it. But if you're kind of feeling down when you wipe in a Nuzlocke, I think the best bet is to just like Nuzlocke a different game for a little bit or do a casual playthrough for a little bit. And then not do the Nuzlocke until you actually want to do it again, right? 
Pinky has a really bad hitting power type. I want to say it's poison type, but I don't actually remember. Either way, it means we have to use Mach Punch to get through Rourke, which is borderline impossible. Mach Punch doesn't even two-shot the Geodude, and we take way too much damage from Rock Throw. I try to induce a burn with Ember, since it does similar damage anyways, but that doesn't end up working. We are able to take out the Geodude, and the Onyx is hot garbage, so it can't knock us out either, <laughs> but Kranidos is able to finish the job. With a bit of luck, Stupid or a slightly stronger Monferno, I guess, this is technically possible, but this is an important thing to keep in mind when evaluating whether a specific challenge run is actually possible I already said this, Slagon. Sometimes Slag the first gym leader is a complete brick wall to what seems like an otherwise really exciting challenge. Rourke is especially difficult because he has I already two said physical this, walls and a hard-hitting ace. So if you can't get access to a special move before level 14, you're usually pretty screwed. This wow. is particularly problematic in Platinum, where hidden power has been removed from wow. the trainer school in Jubilee City. So really kind of stepped on my uh, without self, just huh. insane amounts of luck or some rule change for the first gym. Anyways, on the very next attempt, Monkey gets hidden power fighting again, so it's all good. We're able to sweep through Rourke on attempt 5 and then move on with our lives. We also, of course, catch Cow, and then we plow through Gardenia's grass types. However, because of new Monkey and new Cow's different IVs, EVs, nature, etc, etc, their stats are a little different, and so the plan that I had for Maylene and Crasher Wake in attempt 3 won't work here. So here's what I worked out instead. I lead Cow into Maylene's Metatite and set up a sunny day, as she goes for a Drain Punch. Then I switch to Monkey, who gets hit by a Confusion. Even if that Confusion crit, we would be fine. And Monkey is also confusion would have been bad though. in case of Confusion. From here, oh, three never mind. throwers person who by Sun knock out Maylene's entire team. Barring Metatite using Metatite and then getting a critical hit Drain Punch, that plan is foolproof. The plan for nice. Wake is a little less foolproof. Unfortunately, Monkey doesn't have a high enough attack stat this time to be able to reliably knock out Floatzel even after a Sword Stance. So I have to bet on Cow. I lead Monkey into Crasher Wake's Gyarados to eat up the attack drop from Intimidate. Monkey also has an Iron Ball equipped, which quarters his speed. This allows Monkey to use U-Turn after Gyarados has attacked to switch into Cow without Cow taking any damage. This is a bit dangerous because it risks a critical hit Brine, a flinch from Bite, or Swagger. But thankfully we pull it off and Cow comes in with neutral stats. Next, I need to set up a Sunny Day, which puts us at risk to a Swagger, but Gyarados just goes for a Bite again. Then, a Weberberry boosted Natural Gift kills the Gyarados, which gets us another level and enough speed points to outspeed the Floatzel. Wagzire comes out second and goes down to a Solar Beam, which is now a single turn move because of the Sun. And last is Floatzel, who goes down to a single Solar Beam as well. Did I just sweep through Crasher Wake's Water Type Gym with a Ponypaw? Yes. Yes, I did. Next up. I don't mean to toot my own horn or anything, but that was pretty sick. That that was really sick. Um, I don't fully remember doing that, but that was that was awesome. That was just freaking awesome. Um. Jesus, that was great. There's not too many monotype Nuzlocke's that are like make you do that type of like setup with U-turn and a lagging tail or iron ball or whatever. Like, um, dang, dang, pretty, pretty, pretty proud of myself for that one. Can I stroke my own ego any harder here? Like, that was really good. Let's surely if we can get past crash or wake the water type trainer there will be nothing that will stop monkey and cow in attempt number five right surely up is round two against fantina i've oh, yeah, this strategy lady. to make it a little more to our advantage but it's still not flawless i start with swords dance and drift limb goes for the ominous wind there's half a second of absolute fear that it'll get another omni boost but thankfully it doesn't I go for another sword stance and Gust hits hard, but a Citrus Berry heals enough health Gust not hits in range hard. of <laughs> So a Flame Wheel takes out the Drift Limb. The Mismagius and the Gengar in the back also go down nice. to Flame Wheels, okay. winning us the fifth gym badge and getting us our furthest attempt yet. Ultimately though, this still wasn't the best game plan right. because a lot of things still could have gone wrong. We had Aerial Ace to play around Minimize, which would have killed after two sword stances, but a critical hit from Gust or a boost from Ominous Wind would have definitely ended the run again. The unreliability of AI is a really big pain. Okay. Anyways, our next stop is Cantalave City to fight Rourke's dad, Byron. Like I got in my we way. We do get stopped rude. by our rival rival here, and I know I've been skipping all the rival fights, but it's because he's really underwhelming in Diamond and Pearl. For example, during this specific fight in Platinum, he has a Star Raptor, but here, it's just a Star Avia. Rival Rival also consistently makes really terrible move choices, so he's never much of a problem. Even in the final battle oh, against rival, rival, rival before the Elite Four, his Star Raptor doesn't know Brave Bird and Diamond and Pearl, so it's super easy. We're just gonna ignore these battles from here on out. As I was that saying, makes sense. Byron. This should be super easy because Byron has steel types. However, because we had to get rid of close combat for the fight with Fantina, we don't actually have it here since Infernape doesn't actually learn close combat until level 41. This isn't a problem against the Bronze Orb since it goes down to a flamethrower, but it does mean that we need to rely on hidden power fighting for the Bastiodon, which isn't enough for a one shot. But Bastiodon just retaliates with an ancient power. Was I... Was I dead there to a Metal Burst? Does it have Metal Burst in Diamond and Pearl? Because, yikes, that would have really sucked.
Imagine losing a Pokemon to Byron, the Steel-type trainer, in the Fire-type Monolock. That would have been bad. Uh, okay, well. Which, even if it got the Omni Boost and it crit, it wouldn't matter. Last is Celix, and it goes down to a Flamethrower too, getting us an easy sixth gym badge. Yeah, great. With our new level cap at 42, we Cap got Rapidash! is now able to evolve into his beautiful final form, a Rapidash. This is way too late of a level. I don't know why Game Freak was thinking here. What is this, Unova or something? Like, why does this evolve at level 41? I mean, I get in the original games, you don't get it until pretty late in the game, but like, come on. Ponyta sucks to evolve at level 41. That's that's an insult, but whatever. We we made it. We got we finally got the freaking pointy horse, baby. With that, we have our final pointy cow, 14. excuse me. But can we even get there? There's a bunch of Team Galactic stuff that we have to do here now, but we can skip it since it's all really easy. We eventually get to Snowpoint City, where it's time to take on Candace and her Ice types. Naturally, this is pretty easy, with flamethrowers just ripping through her first three Pokemon. Metachamp is fourth, and actually holds on from a flamethrower, and retaliates with a Force Palm that actually would have killed me if it crit. So, that was pretty reckless, and I should have been planning around that. I lucked out. Got There's lucky. a lot of ways that I definitely could have played that battle safer. They say that luck is the best skill you can have as a Nuzlocker, and I have to agree. Because I, I said really that, I'm there. Because I was so preoccupied by what comes next, which is easily the biggest challenge of the run so far. I remember this. But before we break that down, I want to talk briefly about IVs, or uh, individual values. In my previous Harley videos, Quinn. I've talked a bit about EVs, or effort values, which are points to stats that your Pokemon gain from defeating other Pokemon. So essentially, you have complete control over the EVs of your Pokemon. IVs, on the other hand, are individual values assigned to your Pokemon. Each Pokemon has an IV for each of the six stats, and each IV can range from 0 to 31. Pokemon with 31 okay. IVs will have better stats than Pokemon with zero IVs, assuming all else between the Pokemon is equal. So basically, certain Pokemon are just inherently better than others. When you catch a Pokemon, its IVs are generated at random, for the most part. And these IVs cannot be changed, at least not in Generation 4. <laughs> this is giving, like, <laughs> like, slide deck at a business meeting, uh, some, like, shitty PowerPoint that you paid millions of dollars to some consulting company so that they could tell you that, like, you need to make more money to be more profitable or something. It's random. Can't change. Profit equals business. You know, like um, this This could be done better. But I do like, like, I think my script is solid. I just think the visuals could be a little uh, <laughs> like you showed someone this. Who who made this? This is, a, this is done by a three-year-old or somebody with a business master's degree, you know? Or so when I received Monkey, his IVs at the start oh, look at the same move. throughout the rest of the playthrough. And these horrifying. IVs, in addition to his nature and his EVs, of course, determine the stats that he'll have at any given level, which in turn determines how much damage he does to other Pokemon and how much damage he receives from other attacks. So what are Monkey's IVs? Well, in-game, it's pretty much impossible to tell what your Pokemon's IVs are. If you monitor your EVs, you can use online IV calculators to get a good estimate based on the stats at any given level, but we can actually just check the exact IVs and EVs of any Pokemon using PK Hex. The results? Not great. I don't know what that is. I've never used PK Hex in my life. I calculated these with, with math and, and testing, yeah. While Monkey does have a 30 special attack ID, which is great, and his defenses are average to good, his three remaining stats are pretty piss poor. Piss most notably, poor. and most importantly, he has an attack IV of two. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Which is really, truly terrible. Now, for the most part, even during challenge runs, mediocre IVs aren't a huge deal. It's True. really only in fringe cases where this actually makes a significant difference, so generally, you don't really need to worry too much about IVs during a Nuzlocke. But in a run where there's only two Pokemon to tackle every single problem that you face, <laughs> fringe cases are a lot more common. And our next challenge just so happens to be one of those cases. Up next, we have to save the world by stopping Team Galactic at Spear Pillar. As is usually the case with world-ending conflicts, this is resolved with Pokemon battles, specifically two Pokemon battles. Be cool if that was true in real the life. This is a double battle against Galactic Commanders Mars and Jupiter, with Rival Rival as my part. Yeah, so this is like one of the like differences between Diamond and Pearl and Platinum that actually like makes Diamond and Pearl harder. Because in Diamond and Pearl, I don't know if you remember this, but you don't get a break between the double battle with Mars and Jupiter and Cyrus. Like, there's no distortion world and, like, stupid puzzle that takes 30 minutes no matter how many times you do it. You just go straight into the battle, and that's actually really difficult. I think you do get healed, but um, still, like, imagine if Cyrus had his full team with, like, Houndoom and everything. That would be very difficult. Fortunately, Cyrus's team is much easier in Diamond and Pearl, so it kind of, you know, balances out a bit. Partner. The battle isn't particularly difficult on the surface, but because Rival Rival leads with a Munchlax, he can oftentimes just be pretty much dead weight. On top of that, after beating Mars and Jupiter, you're immediately challenged by Cyrus. Rival Rival does heal your Pokemon, but it means that you can't switch up the Stepped order of your team, myself again. your held items, or your moveset. 
So everything used for the Mars and Jupiter fight has to also be optimized for the Cyrus fight, which is an incredibly specific and difficult challenge. Cyrus has four Pokemon, all of which can do a ton of damage to Monkey and Cow. Cow isn't strong enough to handle this fight on his own, and switching between Pokemon is too risky, so it's essentially up to Monkey to solo Cyrus. But there's a lot of problems. First, he leads with a Honchkrow that knows Drill Peck. A critical hit from that Honchkrow will mm -hmm. instantly kill Monkey. There's nothing I can do about that, unless I hold a Koba Berry to reduce the damage from a super effective flying type move. He also has a Gyarados though, that knows Earthquake and Aqua Tail, which can one-shot Monkey, so we need to be able to kill the Gyarados in one shot. Unfortunately, as we already know, that's very difficult to do since Gyarados has Intimidate, which lowers our attack, and the only reliable way to one-shot the Gyarados is with a Natural Gift Electric Berry. On top of that, there's also a Crobat, which can do a lot of damage with Cross Poison or Air Slash, and a Weavile, which can do a lot of damage with Brick Break. Plus, Crobat and Weavile are super fast, so we'll need a ton of speed investments to outspeed them. So how are we going to do this? Well, the plan is to set up a Sword Stance on Honchkrow. If the Honchkrow doesn't crit a Drill Peck, or Monkey is holding a Koba Berry, Monkey will be able to survive and have enough boosts to be able to one-shot the Gyarados and the Crobat with one specific move, Rock Slide. At plus one attack, Rock Slide will kill Gyarados and Crobat. But there is a catch. Rock Slide has 90% accuracy, which means if we miss Rock Slide on any of these Pokemon, they'll retaliate with a kill. There is one way around this, though. By having Monkey hold a wide lens, we can increase the mm -hmm. accuracy of Rock Slide to 99%, but I'm too weak, making it much more likely like that we don't stone, miss an attack. Right? But there's another problem. Remember how I said that Monkey had an attack IV of 2? Well, because of that, and his neutral nature, <laughs> even sucks. if we have max attack EVs, Monkey is not guaranteed to kill Gyarados or Crobat with Rock Slide. In Pokemon, there's a factor of randomness added to every damage calculation, such that any given attack has a range of damages that can be given. So while Rock Slide can kill these Pokemon, Monkey's attack IV is so bad that there are a few of these lower damage rolls that will actually leave both of those Pokemon with a sliver. So to avoid this, we actually need to give Monkey a Hard Stone, which will boost his Rock-type attacks, guaranteeing the kill on Gyarados and Crobat. If we hit. There's really nothing we can do about this. We can't cover all our bases, so we need to risk a crit from Drill Pack and risk several misses. This is easily the most stressed I've ever been for any battle in any challenge that I've done so far. But first, we... So I really liked that. Um, I think, you know, it's obviously a lot, and I'd probably try and figure out a way to cut it down a little bit. And you can spice it up a little bit by having more footage and I don't know, it, it's tough. But what I really, really like about it is that it lays out all the problems for this battle. And I think it would be redundant or like it would be too much to do it for every single time I run into a problem, especially in a challenge like this. But I think it does a really good job at capturing what I'm thinking about when I'm doing these challenges. And I really like that it lays out all the problems. It works. It almost like explains my thought process, how I came up with the strategy that I came up with so that it gives the viewer all the information that I had and makes them understand why what I'm doing is, in my opinion, at least the most optimal play. Informing the audience is something that I think is really, really important in my videos. I go to great lengths to try and do something like this. And for one of my very first videos, I think this did an excellent job at it. Uh, again, not to toot my own horn or anything. It's kind of weird to like say that I did an excellent job. Like I get that, but like, um, I don't know. I, I was just really impressed with like how well everything was laid out. Again, I would make it more entertaining. I would use more visuals to kind of like clear things up, use zooms to, to like point at the Pokemon that I'm talking about so that the audience understands like what to look at on the screen at any given point. But, you know, I, I think this is, that, that was really, really solid. And um, like one of my biggest hopes is that People watch my videos and they always understand why I do what I do. And that information can help them improve at the game as well. So, okay, let's keep going. We need to beat Mars and Jupiter with Rival Rival. They start the battle with their two Bronzor. I've taught Monkey Flame Wheel so I can take out Commander Mars' Bronzor as Munchlax hits a Body Slam on the other. Perugly comes out next, so I target it to force a two-on-one. And fortunately, Rival has the same idea because he hits Perugly with a Body Slam that paralyzes it. Good job, Rival. Hell on yeah. Next turn, I decide Future to King Snorlax right there. Stance. Perugly and Bronzor double up on Monkey as Rival just uses Stockpile. Right after I complimented you, Rival. Really? Never Anyways, mind. On the next turn, I take out the Perugly with a Flame Wheel, and then Bronzor hits an Extra Sensory as Rival just uses Swallow. With that Extra Sensory damage, Monkey is looking pretty low, so I have to switch out to Cow. Then I go for a Protect to see if Rival will do some damage, but Munchlax goes down. Good. So I set up a Sunny Day as Rival's oh, Ponyta goes for a Will-O-Wisp. On the son. next turn, Flamethrower takes care of the Golbat, and Fire Blast from Ponyta takes care of the Bronzor. Mars and Jupiter are powerless against Cow and Baby Cow. Golbat is next, but a Flamethrower plus Burn damage takes it out, and then last is Skuntank. We hit it hard with Flamethrower, but it hangs on with a Sliver and retaliates with a Poison Job that actually would have killed if it crit. But luckily it didn't, so we win the battle with one more Flamethrower. Nice. You know, Rival Rival was actually not completely useless. I'm proud of him. 
Now it's Cyrus time. I know what has to be done, and there's not much to do but pray that luck is on our side. Cyrus leads Honchcrow, and I go for Swords Dance. And then the idiot AI goes for a Dark Pulse, so I suppose that's nice. It means that it didn't see the crit with Drill Pack. Now, unfortunately, no, it doesn't. That's not what it means. It's just random. Jupiter, we didn't have space for close combat, so I do need to risk a rock slide miss here. So I click rock slide, and it connects. One down, two to go. Gyarados comes out, and rock slide connects again. Next is Crobat, but even if we miss our rock slide here, it actually does need a critical hit with air slash or cross poison to knock us out. But we don't even miss. That is three for three rock slides, and after knocking out Weavile with a flame wheel, that Cyrus defeated. What an absolute relief. But now we've just jumped. Yeah, so that obviously worked. Um, I'm wondering whether having wide lens on it and risking the rolls was actually the better play, given that the AI is random and there's also a 30% chance to flinch with Rock Slide. Um, I obviously don't know that, like the math off the top of my head, but that could have been better than doing the hard stone play. I'm not totally sure, um, especially because there's also crit chance. So guaranteeing the hits to roll for the flinch might be better if it's only like an 18% chance to miss out on the kill with like some low rolls. I don't know, but clearly it worked. So let's keep rolling. Out of the frying pan and into the fire because it's now time to fight Dialga. And since Dawn won't let us leave, I can't teach Monkey close combat. So we don't have a reliable way to one-shot it. This is terrifying since Roar of Time can one-shot Monkey and Cow. Fortunately, Dialga is a Rowan's cutting me off, but I blame Dawn. Randomly. Damn so the if patriarchy. Use Roar of Time, we might be able to stand a chance. So we slowly approach Dialga and prepare for a terrifying battle with the God of Time. From here, it's a straight shot to Volkner. Although Run away, rapid ass. For a fire type trainer. <laughs> Again, you could play into that with sounds and stuff, but like, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, you know? So, but yeah, <laughs> that, that's, that was a good gag. I like that. Seriously, Flint? A low punny? A drift blim? A steelix? You make me sick. Experience management is absolutely terrifying here because we do get really close to overleveling as a result of all the mandatory battles in Volkner's gym. But it works out, and once we get to Volkner, a sword stance from Monkey, followed by four close combats, is enough to kill all of Volkner's electric types. Also, Does we Raichu have static? In case static activated on Raichu, so this battle okay. is literally unlosable. I'm sorry, I'm With sorry, that, Flygon. Our next stop is the Elite Four. So after clearing through Victory Road, destroying Rival Rival one last time, and getting to the level cap, and also doing hours of preparation, we're ready to take on the Elite Four with a monkey and a cow. Here's our final team. Let's see if we've got what it takes. There's a few Elite Four members that will require oh, I gave some pretty risky seals. strategies, and I'll make sure to explain them before we try them each time. But Aaron, the bug type Elite Four member, is not one of those people. I start the battle with Monkey in Blaze range so that his fire type attacks are boosted. I also give him a choice specs. Okay, this is a little too flashy. Every single one of Aaron's Better editing members, here, please. Even the Drabian in the back. And that's an easy first victory. So next up is Bertha. But the one strategy down. for Bertha is almost completely foolproof. She leads with a Quagsire. Here's its moveset. If you notice, her only damaging move is Dig. So by teaching Protect to Monkey, I can avoid any damage from Quagsire other than Sandstorm Chip. What a shit This allows me to set. safely set up the two <laughs> Calm Minds necessary for Grass Nuts to sweep through Bertha's entire team. The one problem is that Quagsire could spam Double Team, and with incredibly terrible luck, I could miss enough Grass Knots that Sandstorm Chip takes me out or I run out of PP, but that would be insanely unlucky. Like less than 1% chance of happening. No one is that unlucky. So Bertha leads Quagsire. That's what we and call foreshadowing. And Bertha just throws the game by making the stupefying decision to go for double protects as I set up Calm Lines. So the Grass Knot hits on the next turn, and then Grass Knot sweeps through the rest of Bertha's team. Nice. Well, almost. Pseudo Wudo is last, and it hangs on to Grass Knot. I completely forgot that Sandstorm buffs the special defensive rock types. That's a mistake on my part, but fortunately it's an okay one to make here, because Pseudo Wudo doesn't know a ground type move, so even with a crit, I would have been fine since I have a Citrus Berry on Monkey, so that would even prevent the Sandstorm chip from taking me out. Anyways, it was a little sloppy, but that's Bertha defeated. Okay. Next is the fake fire type trainer. Flint. Owning up to your mistakes, that's good. this is actually good. a bit tricky. We need to set up a sword stance with Monkey, but the Rapidash knows Bounce. So if it uses Bounce and it either crits or paralyzes me, I'm actually in a bit of trouble. Unfortunately, I can't hold a Cherry Berry or a Koba Berry for either of those two scenarios because we need a Culver Berry so that we're able to take care of the Drift Blim in the back. So I teach Monkey Dig. That way, if the Rapidash uses Bounce on the first turn, I can use Dig on the second turn to avoid it. Unfortunately, because the DP AI is so dumb and unpredictable, that's not really guaranteed. It could also just go for a Flare Blitz. And if that Flare Blitz crits, then I'm in trouble because Flint's Infernape knows Mach Punch, which is priority, and it could then kill me with a priority Mach Punch if that Mach Punch crits. So this is kind of a risky battle. Mm -hmm. On the first turn, I Good go for a Sword Dance, and I pray for anything too. but Flare Blitz. But that is what the DP AI decides to do. So that sucks. Fortunately, it's not a crit, so it's not the end of the world. 
I can't use Dig here though, because if Rapidash uses Bounce, then I lose. So I have to go for Close Combat, which lowers my defense and special defense by one Sage. Fortunately, with the HP that I'm at, a Mach Punch from Infernape won't kill me, even with the defense drop, even if it crits. And Infernape should be coming out next, because it's the only one of Flint's Pokemon that has a super effective move into Monkey. Okay. But for some reason, Lopunny comes out. Presumably because it knows Mirror Coat, which is coded as a Psychic type attack, and the AI reads that as super effective against Monkey. Yeah, so Generation 4 Switch AI is really, really, really complicated. If I remember, I will include a link to a video from DRXX Drew that kind of explains it. That's a, It's at least true for Renegade Platinum and regular Platinum. I don't know if it's the exact same as Diamond and Pearl, but like how the AI chooses to bring stuff in is very, very confusing. And it's not as black and white as, oh, it's got a super effective move. So... Maybe the low punny is doing this because of the psychic mirror coat, but also maybe not. Maybe there's just something else to it. That might be a little bit of misinformation that I just spread on the internet, but it's not the first time and it won't be the last. Monkey. That's dumb. And unfortunately, this low punny is surprisingly bulky, so a dig won't kill it. So I have to use close combat to knock it out, mm -hmm. which again lowers my defenses. This means that mock punch from Infernape will now kill if it crits. So the Infernape comes out, and on the next turn, it goes for Mac Punch. But thankfully it doesn't crit, and we were able to retaliate with a close combat of our own. Yeah, so I mean, there's obviously nothing wrong with this, but I think if I were to play this again, like, that is a very, very suspenseful moment, like, seeing it do mock punch and everything, I think I could really play into that with some better editing to, like, really build up the suspense and make the audience think that, like, Monkey's gonna die here. But obviously, you know, we're, we're getting to a pretty serious and sad finale here so um maybe i felt like at the time it wasn't worth it i don't know knocking it out next is steelix which goes down to a close combat and then last is the drift blim who goes down to the cobra berry boosted natural gift flint and his fake fire types cobra berry are boosted natural the last elite gift. four member is lucian and now here's where things get tricky lucian leads mr mine sometimes it'll just try and set up screens we need to set up a sword stance with monkey to successfully knock everything else out in the back Shadow Claw will take care of the Mr. Mime, the Alakazam, and the Medicham. And Close Combat will take care of the Giraffe Rig and the Bronzong. But if Mr. Mime sets up a Reflect, then we need to set up two Sword Stances and stall out the Reflect with a few Protects before the Bronzong comes in. But unfortunately, the Mr. Mime might not go for Screens. It might just go for a Psychic. In that case, we need to be able to survive a Psychic. We can actually change the EVs that Monkey has by using some EV Berries and some Vitamins to take Monkey's Defense EVs and put them into Special Defense. This will make it so that Mr. Mime can never one-shot Monkey with I'm Psychic I'm pretty proud of myself so for coming crit. up with this. We can also play around the crit by getting Monkey might be the first time I've ever the damage this. of a Psychic-type move, which makes this a guaranteed win. But, because of Monkey's pesky attack IV of 2, plus 2 close combat doesn't always kill the Bronzong. It actually has an 87.5% chance to one-shot. And mm -hmm. if it doesn't one-shot, the Bronzong will likely retaliate with a Psychic or an Earthquake for the kill. I can guarantee a kill on the Bronzong with a Fist Plate to boost Monkey's Fighting-type moves, but then we're at risk to a crit from Mr. Mime. Ultimately, I choose to go with the Fist Plate, since 6.25% chance of a crit is lower than 12.5% chance of missing the kill with close combat. Makes sense. Either way, there is a chance we lose the run here. So, Lucian leads Mr. Mime, and we set up a Sword Stance. And then Mr. Mime sets up a Light Screen. Literally the best-case scenario. So, from here, <laughs> Monkey sweeps through the rest of Lucian's team, taking no damage. Thank you, crappy DP AI. With that, we've beaten the Elite Four, and I am feeling great. Damn. The final That's obstacle good. of the challenge is Cynthia. She's tough for sure, but she's significantly easier in Diamond and Pearl than she is in Platinum. And I actually have a really great strategy planned out for this. Thanks to the fact that Monkey single-handedly took care of the Elite Four on his own, he's gained a bunch of levels, which means that he can outspeed the Garchomp. So, with a Palmag Berry equipped, we can make Natural Gift a 70 base power Ice-type move. At plus 2 attack, that will one-shot the Garchomp. A plus 2 close combat will also kill Cynthia's Gastrodon, Milotic, and Lucario. And a plus 2 Earthquake will kill the Roserade. So that just leaves the Spiritomb. I'm which anxious for myself because I know EVs what's coming. Here by dropping our attack down from 252 EVs I don't want to relive EVs this. With the use of a single Kelpsy Berry. Then we can use the leftover EVs to give us some more HP and some more special defense EVs so that Psychic will never kill Monkey, even if it crits. Unfortunately, a plus two Earthquake won't kill the Spiritomb I worked so hard so for this. if Spiritomb gets a crit with either Psychic, then it's game over. The way around this is to bring Cow off the bench. By leading Cow, we can do enough damage to Spiritomb with Solar Beam to guarantee a kill with an Earthquake from Monkey. I've decided to use Solar Beam because even if the Solar Beam crits, it won't kill Spiritomb. After that, though, it means that we need to sacrifice Cow to get a free switch into Monkey. But Cow's sacrifice will give us a guaranteed win. So we prep Cow for the slaughter, and we give him a heart scale to show just how much we love him. We do love and you, then Cow. And we step into Cynthia's chambers. The music starts, and our battle begins. She leads Spiritomb, and Cow starts with the Solar Beam. Spiritomb goes for a Dark Pulse, and then Cow hits her with Solar Beam, doing the damage needed for Monkey to get the kill with a plus two Earthquake. But then Spiritomb goes for a Silver Wind, and she gets the Omni Boost. This sucks. 
because it means that Earthquake won't kill from this range. It also means that a critical hit from Spiritomb will now kill Monkey, so suddenly victory is no longer guaranteed, but it's still really heavily in our favor. We need to go for a Flamethrower to get a little more damage on Spiritomb, but if it burns or crits, then we're in trouble because Spiritomb will faint or it'll just heal. Luckily, the Flamethrower does neither, and Spiritomb goes for a Dark Pulse, leaving Cow with 4 HP. On the next turn, I use a Sunny Day so as not to damage the Spiritomb anymore, and Cow goes down to a Silverwind. While this Silverwind doesn't trigger another Omni Boost, it does get a crit, so this Spiritomb is kind of on fire. Thank you for your sacrifice, Cow, but you've now set up Monkey for the victory. All we need to do is dodge one more crit as we set up a Sword Stance. I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm at a loss for words. Even as I write this script, rewatching the gameplay, it's unbelievable. Uh, I remember this moment. I, I, I don't have any words for it now either. Like, it's just, I, I remember being so upset at the time because I think the only other challenge that I streamed before this was uh, Emerald with ground types only. And in that stream, I also wiped to the champion and then went and did the whole thing again. I, I'm not going to redo the whole thing again for this one for reasons that I think past me will explain. But um, I remember being so stressed that like I felt like such a failure and everybody thought that I was going to be so bad at the game. Because, like, I could never close on stream. And I thought that, like, people were thinking that I was, like, cheating offline or something. Because, like, the two streams that I did online or the two challenges I did online, like, I, I couldn't finish. And I, and I, you know, finish all the ones that I do offline. And so, like, I, I had so much self-doubt about myself after this. And in retrospect, like, like I don't know. We just watched 40 minutes of some, like, some pretty freaking awesome plays. Like even, even two years later, those were some of the best plays I've ever done in a Nuzlocke. Like after I, you know, in terms of like strategies and stuff, like even after I did Renegade Platinum, even after I did Blaze Black, like I, I'm really proud of this run. So I hope that I'm not too hard on myself in this video at the end here, but I was very, very hard on myself on stream and then immediately after stream. Like I was so down on myself um but you know i think that's just you know it's it's pokemon for you um it is what it is and it obviously makes for a very <laughs> like hopefully a very entertaining video so i threw for content i guess or or cynthia's spirit tomb really came to play for content i guess <laughs> let's let's see how this finishes up really just terrible terrible luck the chances yeah. of losing this battle this way are 10% for the Omni Boost from Silverwind, times 6.25% for the critical hit, for a nice healthy 0.625% chance. Yeah, that's brutal. That's pretty soul crushing. But admittedly, 0.625% is a little misleading, because it is ignoring all the chances that this run could have wiped well ahead of time. I could have missed Rock Slides against Cyrus, I could have been crit by Crasher Wake, Fantina, Candice, Mars and Jupiter, or any number of other random trainer battles that I didn't show where I was accidentally playing suboptimally. The fact of the matter is that in a run like this, where you can't have a single death, every battle matters, and the tiny chances here and there will all eventually add up. So it's honestly surprising that I was even able to make it as far as I did. Does that make it feel any better to wipe to the champion? No. 0.625% chance is still really low, but I am incredibly proud of myself for getting to this point. And this challenge was so much fun. I've never had to use so many fringe strategies, and I've never felt more excited than when I was able to finally crack a strategy that I thought was impossible. That being said, this still really sucks, mm -hmm. and I'm definitely not going to be retrying this challenge anytime soon. I think I've proven that the challenge is possible. In fact, we can try it one more time after the wipe just to see what would happen. And hilariously, on this second attempt, the Spiritomb still does get an Omni Boost off. Actually, it gets two Omni Boosts off. I have no idea what Cynthia is feeding her Spiritomb, but sign me up for whatever it is. Despite the two Omni Boosts, though, on this next attempt, the Spiritomb doesn't get the critical hit with Psychic, and we're able to sweep through Cynthia's team exactly as expected. So, can a hardcore Nuzlocke of Diamond with fire types only be completed? Yes. Can I complete a hardcore Nuzlocke of Diamond with fire types only? No. At least not at this time. And somehow, I'll have to be okay with that. But Nuzlocke's are failed all the time, even by the best Nuzlockers. So, that's Pokemon for you. I'm sure I'll attempt this again someday, but for now, it's not yet. on to another <laughs> challenge.
As an educational point, let's just look at one last thing before we go. A user in my Twitch chat pointed out that had Cow known Captivate instead of Sunny Day, I would have won this battle. Captivate is a move that lowers the special attack of a Pokemon of the opposite gender by two stages. Had I done this instead of use Sunny Day on this third turn here, then the Spiritomb would be at minus one special attack, and a critical hit would result in neutral damage, never resulting in a kill on Monkey. Of course, this strategy isn't flawless either, because it does require Cow to survive a follow-up attack from the Spiritomb, which isn't always guaranteed. And we can't go for Captivate before Flamethrower, because that additional damage is still needed on Monkey to make sure that we can get the kill with Earthquake. So, while Captivate still doesn't always guarantee a win, it would have been a good contingency plan for me to have. But again, playing around that 0.625% chance isn't always easy to remember to do. Especially since using a Bug-type move against my Fire-type Pokémon seems like something Random that the AI. AI shouldn't and wouldn't do. Regardless, lesson learned, and I'm a better Nuzlocker for it. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching this video and for all your continued support. If you enjoyed watching, <laughs> please like the video and subscribe for more challenges just like this. Okay, yeah, so uh, we don't need to watch the last 20 seconds of this, it's the same in every video. Um, I thought that was really well put. Again, patting myself on the back. But, you know, I think people tend to have like a, a confirmation bias when it comes to negative RNG um, in Pokemon, but also just like the negative RNG of life. Like people get so fixated on when bad things happen to them that they often forget to acknowledge when good things happen to them. And when you really think about it, every success that you have Every success that anybody has, whether that is in your professional life, um, trying to become a YouTuber, like all of that happens because of just incredibly lucky things that happen to you. Obviously requires skill, but there's always luck in every single thing that you do. You really do need to acknowledge the good things that happen to you and not just like shrug that off and attribute it all to skill. You know, that's how you get better is you acknowledge when you got lucky, you acknowledge when you got unlucky, and you learn how to avoid getting unlucky again, avoid putting yourself in situations where you need to rely on luck, instead of just kind of like going through life and accepting everything that happens and being like, oh, it'll be better next time if I just do the same thing over and over again. So that's kind of one of the the like the philosophies in Nuzlocking that I think is like like not to make a too broad of a point about it, but I think like it's one of the things that you can take from Nuzlocking and apply to your life in terms of like learning and growing as a human or in like whatever skill that you choose to pursue so um yeah i i really liked how i addressed that in the video again i was super pissed at the time i was super super pissed and very upset so um i think it's also important to acknowledge that like you need to allow yourself to be upset when something bad happens but once the time has passed for mourning or grieving or whatever learn from it become a better person from it move on right so yeah, um, that'll do it for the end of this video. I, I really, really enjoyed this. I really, actually really liked this video. Um, I, I honestly watched the Emerald Grass video and I was like, I don't really like this video. Like uh, I feel a little embarrassed that this is one of the most watched videos, um, which for better or worse, may be me being overly harsh, but like this video I think is actually um, at least, you know, for two years has stood the test of time. And I really see a lot of like what I really like in my future videos already budding in this video. So um, if you liked this whole exercise, again, be sure to like this video. Please let me know in the comments. Um, I really do want to hear what you guys have to say about this video and whether you want to see more of them. Go ahead and make a recommendation for which one you want to see next. And I have a couple that I think might make sense as future ones. I'm not going to do every single one, but... This is really fun. I, I, I really, really enjoy like being reflective on my own content because again, I think that's how you grow as a person. All right, well, uh, that's gonna do it for me. Be nice to each other. I will see y'all soon. Peace.